So often when we talk about space, we're talking from a NASA first American perspective. But countries around the world have been heavily involved in space flight for decades. Today on Space Chat, I'll be talking all about international involvement in spaceflight, whether it's other countries' space agencies or even private corporations. Now, if this is your first time here on Space Chat, this is the weekly show where I come on to answer your questions and take a deeper look at Earth, space, and beyond. So let's talk about space and international cooperation. Now, since the dawn of spaceflight, even before human spaceflight was a thing, the United States has not been alone in the pursuit of space exploration. Most famously, human spaceflight was essentially born out of a Cold War era competition between the US and the then Soviet Union, a space race that was egged on by the Soviet Union being the first in space and ended, kind of, sorta, uh, with NASA landing the first humans on the moon with Apollo 11. But what started as the Soviet space program became what we now know today as Russia's space agency, Roscosmos. Now, after the first Soyuz launch in 1967, Russia has continued launching both crewed and uncrewed missions to space for decades, and Roscosmos continues to launch crews aboard its Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station, even crews with both Russian and American astronauts. Now, the space agency has Soyuz flights to the space station planned through March of 2022, so they are still very actively launching astronauts to space, not just from Russia, um, but like I mentioned, astronauts from the US and all over the world. In fact, a major factor in NASA developing its commercial crew program was that so it didn't have to completely rely on Russia to get to the space station, as after NASA's space shuttle program ended in 2011, the agency was completely reliant on Soyuz spacecraft to get NASA astronauts to space. That reliance lasted until the agency was able to start sending astronauts using SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft. So without the commercial space program, NASA might still be totally reliant on these Soyuz launches. Now that doesn't mean that NASA astronauts will never again fly aboard Soyuz craft to the station, uh, it just means that NASA is no longer completely reliant on Russia to get to space. Now, in addition to sending satellites into orbit and astronauts to the ISS, Russia has also tried to land on Mars a few times. Never as successfully, but the agency has sent landers and orbiters to the Red Planet. Uh, in fact, in 1960, Russia was the first nation to ever try and fly by the Red Planet, though the launch was a failure. Now, the nation continued to launch missions, whether they be flybys, orbiters, or landers to Mars throughout the years, um, though they have yet to successfully land on the Red Planet. Now, Russia also had its own space station in the 1980s, Mir, and they're currently considering leaving the ISS program in 2025 unless the US lifts sanctions against the Russian space sector. Now, while US and Russia have collaborated through the years following the space race, with the most obvious collaborations being with the space station and these Soyuz crewed launches, there has been some tension uh, with the Space Force raising concerns about Russian satellites trailing US satellites and exhibiting unusual behavior, uh, including anti-satellite uh, missile tests. Now, moving on from Russia, China has also been a major player in space for quite some time. In fact, the earliest records of rudimentary rockets being built in China date as far back as 900 AD. Now, much more recently, uh, now China was not a player in the mid-20th century space race with Russia and the US. And while China's space program began in the 20th century, the China National Space Administration didn't actually send the first Chinese astronaut into space until 2003. Now, while China has continued to make significant progress in space, especially as of late, there are restrictions on bilateral activities between NASA and China. So while we might see quite a bit of collaboration between NASA and, say, Russia, Canada, other agencies, uh, companies, etc., there is extremely limited collaboration between China and the US when it comes to space. 
Now, jumping back to China's recent progress in space, the nation most recently made history by being the second nation to successfully land on the surface of Mars with its Tianwen-1 mission, which both landed a lander, the, the Zerong rover, and it put an orbiter in orbit around planet Mars. This achievement by China has been so major, in fact, with Zerong already sending images back to Earth that it's already sparking competitive remarks from those at NASA, with NASA's new administrator Bill Nelson pointing to China's success as a reason to ramp up NASA's efforts with its programs, especially with NASA's Artemis program and the crewed return to the moon. Now, China's recent success has been so major, in fact, that some are saying that China might be surpassing Russia as the second dominant power in the spaceflight sector. China is also working to build its Tiangong space station, though recently when a piece of the station was launched to space, the booster from that launch made an uncontrolled re-entry back to Earth, which caused quite a bit of concern at NASA and around the world as it fell back to our planet. Now, while China and Russia are probably the two biggest dominant forces in space besides the US, they're certainly not the only nations making space progress. Canada has also been a big player in space, and they collaborate with NASA quite frequently. Canada actually designed, developed, and built the Shuttle Remote Manipulator System for NASA's Space Shuttle, which has ultimately resulted in the Canada Arm, which you may have seen if you've ever watched a spacewalk. It's something that astronauts now regularly use on the space station for spacewalks to make repairs, maintenance, etc. Canada has also invested quite a bit uh, in NASA, they invested quite a bit in the space shuttle program, and there have been some very well-known astronauts in space, including Chris Hadfield, who many know uh, for many reasons, including his guitar playing. Now, India also has a fairly robust space program. The ISRO, uh, the Indian Space Research Organization, has and continues to accomplish quite a bit in space. India has not yet launched humans into Earth's orbit, uh, though the nation is actively trying to launch a human spaceflight mission and even has astronauts in training. Um, India's Vikram lander attempted to land on the moon in 2019, but unfortunately crash landed. However, India has successfully sent its Chandrayaan-1 mission into lunar orbit, and then in 2019, um, as part of the Chandrayaan-2 mission, while the Vikram lander crash landed, uh, the orbiter as part of that mission did successfully get into orbit around the moon. India also plans to launch Chandrayaan-3 in 2022. Now, India is perhaps most famous for its mission Mangalyaan. Um, there was even recently a movie about it a couple years ago. It was a lot of fun, highly recommend. Um, this is its Mars Orbiter mission, which successfully sent an orbiter to Mars in 2014, which is a huge, huge accomplishment for the agency. Perhaps surprisingly, there have actually been some pretty big spaceflight things that have come out of New Zealand. Uh, with the private company Rocket Lab hailing from New Zealand. Uh, it's a bit different from these other nations' space agencies in that being a private company, it can and has worked directly with NASA, but it is still an international space effort. Now, Rocket Lab has made some major progress recently, uh, and they recently are starting to fly again after an anomaly ended a previous mission. Um, they've also won a contract to design spacecraft for a NASA Mars mission, and revealed plans for their big new rocket called Neutron. Israel has also been active in spaceflight. Israel's Bereshit spacecraft crash landed on the moon in 2019. However, the nation is hard at work uh, trying to get back to the moon with Bereshit 2, and they hope to successfully land this time around. Now, there have been so many more nations with space agencies that I don't have time to dive into every single one of them, but other nations' space agencies, it includes Australia, Belarus, Mexico, Algeria, Austria, Belgium, Brazil, uh, the UK, and so, so many more. Uh, astronauts from different European countries routinely travel to space to the space station with the European Space Agency, and countries and private companies from all over the world continue to make progress in space, especially with the blooming of the commercial space sector. We are seeing quite a bit more uh, space progress and different space initiatives from all over the world, which I think is really exciting. 
So that was my general overview spiel. Uh, obviously, with the time we have, I can't get into all of these specifics of the history of spaceflight for every other nation in the world, but that's a little bit of a recap. So. I'm turning it over to you guys. I want to hear your questions. Drop your questions down in the comments below. Uh, if you haven't gotten the chance to yet ask us a question over social media. While you ask your questions, I'm going to start diving into some of those that we got over social media this week. All right, let's see. Grant on Facebook asks, if a piece of space junk is the cause of a fatality in space or on Earth, is any one government held accountable? This is a great question, um, and this situation, thankfully, has not arisen yet. We haven't had to deal with this in real life yet. Um, and I can't really say for certain if it's kind of vague, not about a specific event. So it would depend. Now, if there was a piece of space junk, a piece of satellite, what have you, that was, after an investigation, found solely responsible for some type of damage, fatality, something tragic like that, I'm sure that there would be repercussions according to the law of you know the country that that satellite or whatever came from um, and also it would play into who that impacted and what country they are from uh, probably a lot of murky gray legal water as if they are two different nations with fairly different laws um, so it really is difficult to say thankfully we have not had to deal with that yet um, but as more things launch to space as low earth orbit gets a little bit more crowded uh, it's possible that we will have to start thinking more and more about what happens when things crash into each other, when things happen with space junk, right? Okay, Rihanna asks on Facebook, scientists must have known that these multi-stage launches would cause space junk. Was there any legislation proposed even way back to the Mercury era? Not really. Um, back then, if we're talking about the Mercury era, if we're talking about over 50 years ago, launching to space was such a rarity and such an unbelievable achievement and ordeal that the thought of launching thousands of satellites into space, um, the thought of launching so much into space that it would cause cluttered junk in low Earth orbit wasn't even really a thought or possibility. Um, now, as we have continued to put more and more satellites and things into orbit, um, obviously that conversation has started and bloomed and continues. Um, but of course, with all of this amazing launch capability, we're seeing it comes with quite a few caveats that we really have to seriously consider. All right, Ami on Twitter asks, what are the other countries of the world that currently have a space program? Great question. Um, so I mentioned a few before, um, and there really are dozens. There are so many more than you would think. Uh, countries that you may have not even thought of in the same breath as space might have their own space agency. Or even countries that don't have a space agency might be part of space initiatives, cooperations, collaborations with other nations or with universities. Um, so many nations around the world are getting involved in space, especially now. Um, I can't list every single one of them right now. We literally don't have the time. But like I mentioned, Mexico, Algeria, Belgium, Brazil, um, Belarus, uh, the UK, so, so many. Um, it's really, really amazing to see. Um, you know, obviously these aren't all brand new space agencies, but uh, space is really booming right now. And so there's a lot more progress happening now and projected into the future. All right, Benny asks on Twitter, uh, is war in space inevitable as we humans colonize deep space? Um, so I hope that we don't colonize deep space. I hope that we, you know, send humans out and explore with scientific intention and keep it as it is. Um, but when we're talking about is war in space inevitable? I really don't think so. I mean, it's been over 50 years that we've been sending humans to space. Uh, the International Space Station is certainly not the first space station, uh, and there has not yet been a war or a battle in space. Uh, you know, when we talk about things like the Space Force, we're not talking about astronauts going up with weapons and fighting each other. Uh, you know, we're mostly talking about protecting telecommunications, satellites, data, I do not think war in space is inevitable. We haven't seen it yet. It seems that those that are working to advance space exploration and the scientific exploration of space aren't interested in war. They're interested in science. They're interested in exploration. And war would only muck that up. 
Um, so I don't think it's inevitable. I hope that I'm right. Right, Donald on Twitter asks, is the US the only country to have an entity like a Space Force? Great question. So I was just talking about the Space Force and no, not really. And the Space Force isn't even really new or that unique. Um, it's essentially a revamped version of the Air Force's space program. There's a little section of the Air Force that dealt with space and the Space Force is basically that. They just kind of carved it out of the Air Force and made it its own thing, gave it its own identity uh, more so. Um, and so, you know, obviously there are so many countries with space agencies, space programs, and robust militaries, um, so we are not unique. Uh, <laughs> all right, and Ravi on, fa on Facebook asks, who owns the moon? Interesting question, Ravi. No one. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing. Now, when we talk about law and international treaty and rules and everything with space, it's not like a completely lawless land. Um, it's not totally up to interpretation, case by case. There is something called the Outer Space Treaty, um, which factors into a newer thing called the Artemis Accords. So the Outer Space Treaty is quite old. Um, it's from kind of the dawn of human spaceflight. And it basically was created to keep things like the moon, um, like these natural assets, how they are, um, to allow us to explore without completely extorting these natural resources. And the newer Artemis Accords kind of jumped on that as we're returning humans to the moon and has been slowly signing nations to, you know, it is, it is a NASA-led, the Artemis Accords thing, as Artemis is a NASA program, but getting nations on board to kind of pledge to explore space sustainably, responsibly. Uh, you know, space is not just there for the taking, we're exploring. We're exploring territory that truly does not belong to anyone. Um, and so it's, it's interesting and I'm curious to see how this continues to play out. So those were all of the questions that I had time for, but before I go, let's quickly review what was new in space this week. So recently, Lockheed Martin won a $4.9 billion contract to build advanced missile warning satellites. Again, we were talking about the military in space before. Pretty intense. Uh, Hubble has been having some issues, unfortunately, after a malfunction with a 1980s era computer that caused the telescope to temporarily stop operations. Also, citizen sciences. Also, citizen scientists have discovered two gas giants around a distant sun-like star. Also, the Ingenuity Mars helicopter aced its eighth flight as it continues to explore and test operations on the red planet. So this has been Space Chat. Thank you all so much for your questions and for joining me yet again this week. I look forward to chatting with you again next Friday and hopefully every Friday for the foreseeable future. And as always, if you have a question about space, any kind of question, um, like you saw me answer those ones before, send them over social media. We're listening and I would love to hear your questions and answer as many of them as possible. Thank you so much.